Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. We are slowly starting to, to board here. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Tyson Barker, and I'm the Deputy Executive Director and uh, Fellow at the Aspen Institute Germany. And we are delighted to have uh, you guys here today for the final uh, uh, final discussion in our series on COVID and technology that we are doing with uh, Google. Um, we have had such a great uh, series of discussions over the past uh, two and a half months from, on everything from artificial intelligence to data protection to uh, technological ethics to startups to uh, industrial policy, etc. And we are delighted to kind of take it out a little bit and uh, zoom out and see how this plays in a geopolitical context. How does this look internationally, generally? And I, of course, want to talk and mention our partner uh, in Google. Uh, I want to show that I have the Corona Van app, which uh, is the Corona contact tracing app here in Germany on my Android phone, which uh, Google was uh, instrumental in providing uh, access to the API and, and helping to set that up, which has now been downloaded since it was launched on Tuesday over 7 million times here in Germany. So we're, we're approaching the 10% mark in the German population. And as I read it, I have a, a low risk right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing good. Um, as I mentioned, we are having this conversation today about geopolitics uh, and technology in the times of Corona. Um, this is an on the record conversation. I think everybody here is pretty fluent in Zoom at this point. Uh, we've all experienced this, but for those who are new to us, uh, a couple of ground rules. If you have a question, once we've started the questions and answers, please just raise your digital hand. We'd love to have you ask your question yourself. Um, but you can also write your question in the Q&A area. And if you are dialing in, you just have to hit star nine. So again, this is on the record. We will post it later on uh, YouTube as well. It's, it's being streamed live on Facebook. And, and with that, I will get to introducing our distinguished speakers. We have four speakers. We're, we're missing one. He's going to come in, in in a little bit. Uh, on three continents, and I will start with our speaker from Hong Kong, uh, Jennifer Jo Scott. Uh, she is the principal at Radiant Partners, which is a direct, it does direct investment in artificial intelligence and deep tech. Uh, she was named by Forbes magazine as one of the world's uh, top 50 women in tech in uh, 2018. Uh, she is very involved in the World Economic Forum, including sitting on its China Council uh, and works on its Council on the Future of Blockchain, uh, has spent a lot of time in the U.S. and Europe, uh, is studied at Yale, Harvard, and Oxford, and I know has a uh, connection to Aspen as well. So thank you for being here, uh, Jennifer. Uh, our you. second speaker is uh, Alexander Stoyanovich who is a serial entrepreneur and expert uh, for digital innovation in regulated markets. Uh, and in 2014, founded the company AVA, which is a data fusion platform and artificial intelligence uh, for security, safety, and risk intelligence, which has been referred to, the, uh, referred to as the European answer to Palantir. Uh, so we'll have, to, we'll have to explore that a little bit. Um, I, I know he's based here in Germany. He's a, a German founder, uh, but has a connection to Russia. And I know this from his past was also had a rap hit single in Russia in the 90s. So that he's a moonlighting as a rapper, but for this discussion, he's a tech. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, and then our final speaker in this round uh, in the United States is a member of the Aspen family, Vivian Schiller. Uh, who is a longtime executive at the intersection of journalism, media, and technology. She's a new member of the Aspen family heading up our digital program, or the Aspen U.S.'s digital program, which is fusing together programs dealing with media, technology, and cybersecurity. Uh, she also served as the founding head of the Civil Foundation, which was an independent non-for-profit committed to the sustainability of trustworthy journalism, very important in these days, um, and has held a number of very... Uh, key executive roles, including president and CEO of NPR, uh, global chair of news at Twitter, general manager of the New York Times, and digital chief digital officer at NBC News. So thank you as well for being here, Vivian. Glad to be here. Uh, our final guest who hasn't joined us yet is uh, Ambassador Henrik Tolkien. Uh, he is the tech ambassador at the German Foreign Ministry. Uh, it has been a big day uh, for the German Foreign Ministry. Uh, it, it looks like he's joining us as we speak. There he is. Okay, thank you. 
<laughs> Sorry, some technical busy, issue. Busy guy. We were just introducing you, so this is perfect timing. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Token is, as I said, uh, the Special Representative for International Tech Policy at the German Foreign Office, a position that he's held since August 2018. Uh, prior to that, he was the Ambassador and Permanent Rep Representative at the UN Agencies in Rome uh, and did a lot of work with the World Food Program, including uh, setting up its Innovation Accelerator in Munich. Uh, prior to that, he uh, led initiatives, Germany's initiatives at the uh, Foreign Office on Climate and Environmental Tech Diplomacy. And perfect for this conversation is a trained medical doctor. So perfect uh, fusion of two areas that we're going to be talking about. So uh, Ambassador Token, I'd like to start with you. Um, I'm going to surprise you. I think, I think you know what might be coming. Um, uh, Chancellor no, Merkel no this morning. Uh, uh, in the Bundestag, where she outlined the priorities of the German EU presidency. Um, it was a very interesting, compelling speech. And in one line, she said, Europe needs to become sovereign digitally and technologically. The pandemic has clearly demonstrated our dependencies. What does she mean and what will be the goals of the, of the German presidency coming up on, on tech and COVID? I'm so glad um, that you're asking very simple and short questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> the official EU presidency program of the, of the German presidency will be launched for the public, I think, rather shortly. So I'm not going to reveal anything um, that has not been said before. But what I can say is, of course, there's a heavy focus on, on, on digital sovereignty, technological sovereignty, but what the chancellor was referring to in her speech, I think, and I didn't have the chance to listen to it, was the fact that we all learned that we were quite dependent on, on let's say, industrial production of certain protection equipment, um, uh, the face masks and stuff like that. And we found out that we also have some uh, critical supply chains when it comes to, to medical pharmaceutical products. Uh, I think this all came up in a discussion and we, kind of re-evaluated the question of vulnerabilities in our supply chains. I, I personally believe this is a, a discussion we need to lead very carefully because Germany is one of the countries that has benefited most from globalization from, let's say, a, a vibrant international trade. So if we talk about reshoring certain types of production, we must be extremely careful not to, let's say, kick off a trend that says, okay, it's great, we built our own cars, our own planes, our own whatever. And so, so the international global trade would be affected in a negative way. Uh, having said this, I think there's a lot where Europe can, let's say, try to recalibrate its dependencies. And um, I'm sure you heard about the French-German initiative about Gaia-X and the idea to create a European cloud-based system that is uh, economically viable. I think this is a very interesting approach. And it's certainly in this line that the German EU presidency will look into a couple of issues that relate to digital and, 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 and technological sovereignty. Uh, with regard to what we do in the Foreign Office, I would like to, to disclose that we are in the process of building an EU digital diplomacy net network. That means that we have encouraged all EU member states to nominate digital ambassadors or digital representatives. And we want to come together, not to create a new platform for agreeing on papers that go through the Brussels machine, but rather to have a kind of diplomatic startup so that we can learn together how to make best use of technology of digital developments for enhancing our foreign policy impact in the world and to better, let's say, make sure that our voice is heard, that our interests are, are being implemented globally in our foreign policy. So that's a very interesting experiment for us and uh, I'm very excited about this. We, we, we might come back to this point about the EU's role in kind of uh, coordinating, managing the tech aspects of, of, of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, but with that, I'm gonna take a piece of that and, and kick it over to, to Jennifer. Um, Ambassador Token mentioned, you know, technology doesn't just mean AI and cloud computing, it can mean things like masks. <laughs> you know, technology has a, a wide range. Um, 
what have you seen? You're, you're sitting in Hong Kong. You have a great vision of the topography in Asia, East Asia, from China to, to South Korea, et cetera. What are the differences that you're seeing in tech adoption, and what can we expect to be the changes that stay with us? So I think, um, thank you, Tyson. I think this is a really great question, and I'm very encouraged to hear from uh, Ambassador Token um, how you know Germany has this vision to really speed up in terms of digitalization. I think COVID, uh, without any doubt, you know, there's a joke that you, which C-suite really speed up your digitalization process is the CEO, CTO, CFO. Um, the right answer is COVID. <laughs> um, so. If we take a look at, you know, go, go back to January in terms of um, uh, take China as an example, and maybe we can extend a little bit to South Korea. Um, we can't talk about technology in isolation because policy decision making uh, in terms of whole process is, um, you know, very interrelated. So from the government point of view, um, on 23rd of January, uh, when Wuhan had 400 cases, um, confirmed cases, and the government announced uh, to lock down 11 million people and uh, start to build 2,000 patients field hospital. That goes to show that how much data-driven decision-making um, play a very important role in this process, right? And the government later on revealed that they did a model that, you know, uh, calculated if they delayed the lockdown by one week, how many more people would die, and two weeks, how many more people would die. And then we come to the company's level. So China has already been uh, the largest uh, online payment, you know, cashless uh, large economy in the world. So based on this, you know, digital payment, uh, online payment platform combined with big data, combined with, um, you know, this very grassroots, grassroots nature of a lot of the large tech companies in China. Um, when COVID happened, it was um, quite quick for um, the government and companies to work together, come up with this, um, you know, color-coded system, um, you know, Alibaba and uh, Tencent started to come with, uh, you know, green, amber, and red, and started in January, February, uh, citizens, every citizens based on, you know, because you have to use WeChat Pay or Alipay in China to, uh, to go out shopping, to go to restaurant, and based on that, um, you know, the China was was able to do uh, trace uh, testing, which was a very important part for China to combat uh, COVID-19, which means if you have uh, visited a, a bread shop and uh, you find, you know, you, you later on find out you actually uh, positive, uh, the government will go into, you know, the payment history and be able to see who else visited the shop on that day, who else is working in the shop, and be able to you know, contact them through WeChat and um, uh, proactively and aggressively calling them in to do testing. And then on the third part um, is uh, come to individual. So this is a very Aspen-esque uh, discussion in terms of this um, trade-off between personal uh, individual freedom versus uh, public uh, health and public security issue. So um, I live in Hong Kong on 23rd of January when we've Id identified two cases in Hong Kong. Uh, on 24th of January in Hong Kong, pretty much everybody was wearing masks. And, um, you know, in East Asia countries, including Japan, you know, South Korea, et cetera, uh, the concept of, um, you know, when there is a greater threat to the society and everybody have to give up a little bit of, uh, of your individual freedom in order to achieve this, um, you know, collective uh, health, collective safety um, is very, there's no negotiation, there's no debate, no discussion. So for us to watch you know, in Europe and US right now, still debating about wearing masks is kind of uh, kind of strange for us. Um, so I think, you know, what happened in China right now, um, I dare say that because of uh, out of necessity, because such a vast country with 1.4 billion people, and when this, you know, pandemic started in this country, um, initially the government really didn't know what they were dealing with. And, um, and you know, try to, manage this process, um, a lot of those kind of very aggressive trace testing, color coding individual um, uh, tracking, etc. It is a great sacrifice to privacy, but 
out of necessity achieve this kind of uh, efficiency um, is going to you know to, to be here to stay so I think it will be a little bit like uh, similar to 2003 when e-commerce took off in China and then in 2013 2014 when online payment took off in China I think after COVID what we'll see in China is this uh, massive leapfrog of uh, digital health infrastructure in China so uh, th thank you. Those are excellent comments. Very, very, actually very eye-opening and perfect setup for a question to Alexander. Because these conversations around uh, contact tracing, we're talking about kind of integrated uh, applications dealing with contact tracing, tying that together with uh, uh, mobile payment systems, that kind of thing. Uh, in, in Germany and Europe, the conversation, it, one, has been quite divergent across Europe, and two, has been... Uh, quite narrow in its focus and very managed very gingerly. Um, I'd be interested because you, in your work, focus so closely on things like uh, facial recognition, working in security, working in geolocation, working on these kind of things. How has that conversation evolved uh, during the COVID crisis and how has that affected discussions that you've been having with governments? Mm, um... Like like a like a like a small question, but like a <laughs> like really really huge uh, answer possible to that. But I will try like to share like the, the two the, the the two most extreme um, perspectives on that, um, and everything in between. You can think really like a like a like a like a like a, a bell curve, right? And um, so the, the the one perspective um, uh, around the use of technology in regards of security, safety, and risk, and those kind of things, and that applies both to the Corona app as well as to facial recognition, etc., is um, that there's still like this this um, this general perception that um, there is a need for one society or an individual to give up on privacy and and and, and data in order to get more security and safety, right? Like it seems to be like a, like a, like a written rule, um, uh, even though you try to find it, who, who wrote down this rule, it's, it's, it's some, to some extent it emerges from, from, uh, from, from experiences and the way how we did things in the past. But just to give a, a couple of examples why I personally believe that this perspective is not right, um, just leaning quickly towards cameras and, and smart cameras that are capable of, of, of uh, not just recognizing faces, you can take this out for a moment, but they're also capable of recognizing distances between people. So you don't need to know whether that was Paul walking next to Marta, um, who's running way too close, like in order to keep like the social distance. Um, you just need to know that there are two people walking along far too close, or you have like these temperature uh, measuring um, systems to some extent also embedded into camera like with infrared, et cetera, that are capable of actually detecting whether someone is coming in with a fever to check in on a plane. Those kind of things have already been done, like in, in other areas, for example, like in, if you want to take a flight out of, out, of, uh, out of the Democratic Republic of Congo, where you had Ebola in, in, the, in the last year, not too extreme, but still you had to go like through such procedures without even recognizing them. And um, in, in regards of COVID-19, there has been a lot of interesting developments um, also technologically speaking about like how you can derive uh, insights and actionable insights from data streams that are not personally driven. For example, I mean, indirectly they are personally driven. Like one interesting example are sewage systems. So it turns out that you can actually uh, detect clusters of COVID-19 infections by looking at the sewage data, you know, because there's, you know, like the byproduct of, of having COVID-19 ends up, you know, like in, in, the, in, the, in the sewage channels. And um, you, can, you can easily detect the RNA, like really look at the, at the liquids down there and figure out like um, whether a specific part of the neighborhood, a specific block, etc., might um, might run into issues way before uh, people start to feel sick because you know like the byproducts um, of, of such an infection immediately start. And then on the other side, I mean, like that was so to say, like the one part looking at um, we don't of uh, like one perspective looking at all of these technologies um, from a from a from a kind of protective. Uh, uh, point of view saying like we don't want to give up information we don't want to 
uh, work with these technologies because we are afraid and that also drove like the current conversation around around um, facial recognition cameras uh, and then facial recognition in general like there's this somehow like this conversation also among like the big tech companies going on is it like is it is it an ethical approach or are we speaking about human rights and freedom because not just because something is ethically correct um, it supports like uh, human rights or, or or freedom in a sense of um, being who I am, you know, like and living as a society that I, the way I want. So there is um, there is like an interesting conversation going on there. And then on the other side, like through this through this conversation, I think technology companies in particular are one of the key drivers um, towards regulation themselves. Um, I think this comes like with with two. Um, comes from two vectors. Uh, one vector being, if you don't want to be regulated without being part, taking part in that conversation, you need to be at the table. So, you know, like um, uh, pushing things forward and trying to figure out like uh, on your own terms. But then on the other side, and this is something that then leads to the question of digital sovereignty, um, is whether, for example, Europe, who is pretty strong in regulating things and very early, like, and, and, and to some extent, even a role model in the world, if you think of GDPR and those kind of things. Um, but if you're potentially like cementing um, existing power structures, right? Like, so um, uh, starting as a Facebook was, was comparably easy. Uh, but if you want to create, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, proposing this, right? But if you wanted to create a, uh, and a, a whole new Facebook, you would have to jump like to a lot of regulatory hurdles, a lot of things that are now have been put into place based on the experiences. So for something new to start, particularly from Europe, um, it becomes very, very hard. And the same applies more and more to artificial intelligence and quantum computing and those kind of things that are related to that. So that digital sovereignty on one side is driven also um, or is, is, is hindered to some extent like by regulation. So I'm, I'm really interested to figure out like also myself like which which direction like for example Europe will take um, uh, to balance these kind of things like over regulating versus uh, you know creating solutions that are helpful and and, and support citizens and societies. Yeah. That's interesting when you, when you mentioned discrimination I thought you were going to go in the direction of you know pre-existing data sets on facial recognition and how they have there has been research to show that they create certain uh, they can automate certain biases, which has become so uh, politically and ethically fraught debate in the United States, also here in Europe. I, it's, it's such a big debate right now, and it's led to some changes in big tech. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. come back to that, but I want to ask um, Vivian, uh, changing gears slightly, um, you know, in this crisis, we obviously have a health crisis, we have an economic crisis, but we also have an information crisis, and that has been identified by WHO, among others. Uh, how have we seen the issue of disinformation evolve? I, I've seen a couple things, but you're the one with the real uh, lay of the land. You, you see what's happening. What's happening in the U.S.? What's happening globally? Well, uh, thanks very much. Um, first of all, let's let's um, let's distinguish between misinformation and disinformation. They're both uh, big problems, but they're but they're they're very different. And just quickly to define, um, disinformation is is intentional. It is intended to, so, you know, there's all kinds of motivations. <laughs> so chaos, make money, whatever it may be. It's, it's false information, knowing, knowingly false information. Misinformation um, is uh, something that is spread uh, perhaps inadvertently by the user for all kinds of reasons, maybe because it's a, it's a, it's a statement, even a false statement that, that comports with what they believe. Um, to be true. So um, it's, they are both equally um, at play right now in the United States and, and certainly around the world. I want to just tie it to, to, to COVID-19, back to COVID-19 for a minute, um, because what's playing out, I'm going to speak specifically about the United States here, what's playing out, COVID-19 in many ways has uh, revealed uh, the, the, the schisms um, happening in the United States and exacerbating them in a significant way. You know, it's fascinating to hear uh, Jennifer talk about, well, of course, there's no debate in Asia that you wear a mask because it is for the public good. Um, that kind of assumption that you do something, you, you, you give up something small, in this case, 
wearing a mask, hardly a huge sacrifice uh, because it's in the public good, something that frankly should be such a simple decision. And yet, um, at least in the United States, it has become ridiculously fraught and political. Um, there is a sense that uh, uh, among uh, huge swaths of America that if a, if a, if a government uh, local government or a store says uh, you need to wear a mask in order to come in here to protect yourself and everyone else that somehow that is a violation of uh, an individual liberty and I'm bringing this up because um, there is the, the same cohort that believes that to be true is also the same cohort frankly that will is susceptible to misinformation around um, around COVID-19 um, that has been, you know, the misinformation around COVID-19 sometimes called the infodemic. Um, and a lot of it is, is frankly coming from the highest uh, levels of government. I'll give you an example just from yesterday. Uh, the vice president had an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal um, saying that uh, the uh, levels of infection are going down. Um, it was particularly, I think, in reference to Texas and Oklahoma, where the president's going to be holding a, a major rally um, without masks on, on, on Saturday, and said that the data uh, indicates that the infection levels are going way down, and anything you read to the contrary is, is fake news. His statements in that op-ed op are completely refuted by uh, easily verifiable data. But that kind of, um, so you could call that disinformation perhaps, but those who spread it and believe it, you know, they are perpetrators of, of misinformation. So it, this gets to be a very, very uh, complicated issue. And um, the sad results of so much information, whether it is spread intentionally or unintentionally, is um, if you really follow that to its, to its core conclusion, the, 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 the more frightening impact of that is not so much any individual uh, uh, falsehood that is spread. It is rather that um, the very notion of, uh, of uh, verifiable evidence-based information is called into doubt um, around the world. And therefore, we, we don't know what to believe. Um, you know, we're being, you know, in many ways, uh, uh, you know, again, coming from the highest, not to get too political here, coming from the highest levels in the United States, don't believe what you see, listen to me. And, um, you know, in the history of the world, this is not a new phenomenon um, for, uh, for leaders to say, the information out there is false. You don't know what to believe. There is no single source of truth. Therefore, I am your single source of truth. And that is um, a risky phenomenon to uh, democracies all over the world. Sorry, I think I've gone a little bit off uh, your original notion, but you know, it's just been so, uh, your, your original question, Tyson, but it's just been so fascinating to see how a health crisis has accelerated and exacerbated every other form of, of crisis, particularly here in the United States. We're seeing even play out uh, in many ways, I would argue that the, that the um, that the that the uh, uh, racism and anti-racism crisis that is, you know, that started in the United States and spread all over the world has, in many ways, also been exacerbated by uh, the the pandemic. So I'll leave it there. There's a lot to unpack. I know that's a, that's, a, that's a lot, and we'll start unpacking. Um, perhaps Ambassador Tolkien and the, and then Jennifer. Yeah, thank you, Tyson. Just a comment from my side. I want to put out a thesis here because for me, all this disinformation and this this um, kind of ignoring scientific facts relates to something um, that I see as a major trend. And in, in, in Europe, 230 years ago, Immanuel Kant, who was the protagonist of enlightenment here said, what is enlightenment? It's the, the exit, the overcoming of self-inflicted immaturity of, of man. And, and immaturity, he, he defined, is the in, in, in incapacity to make use of your own reasoning. And sometimes if, if I look around what's happening now in the public debate, I have the, the creepy feeling that we are kind of rolling back at parts of enlightenment that we mastered 230 years ago, going to back, to, back to some age of mythical beliefs, of conspiracies, but not scientific facts, not evidence. And this is very frightening. Jennifer, would you, you have something to say on this? 
Yeah, I want you, I think, you know, Vivian just really brought up a very important point. Um, I, I like to add on that as well. We live in a world where, where everything's overly politicized. And um, as a Chinese, you know, living in Hong Kong, um, I don't need to go into details, everyone knows our, our life just all about politics in the past 18 months. Um, but what was really apparent was um, when Wuhan uh, uh, and Hubei province was shut down at the beginning, uh, at end of January, and um, uh, pretty much the unified uh, reaction from the West media was, um, you know, typical China, um, you know, in, uh, completely violating human rights and um, the cover up and, um, uh, and then, you know, the logic really was missed was that, and, you know, when I look at, okay, so let's assume that China has a habit to cover up and which is, um, you know, it, it's an accusation not from like nowhere, right? They have a history, you know, Beijing has a his, history to, you know, cover up and local um, government official, etc. So if the assumption is that, you know, China was covering up, and, um, and then you saw the government, you know, lock down 11 million people, um, you know, based on 400 patients. Uh, and uh, this was right before Chinese New Year. The assumption should be this whole thing must be much more serious than it looks, right? So the action should be, you know, we need to over prepare um, this thing is coming at us. Instead, there was no preparation and there was a, so much you know, accusation, overly political accusation. And last time I checked, a coronavirus doesn't have any party affiliation. Um, it just wants to replicate, you know, keep replicating, right? That's the only objective. So I think, you know, it's really hard uh, not to look at every, you know, everything happening in this world without political lens. But I wonder if, um, you know, um, Perhaps you know I have hope in Germany. I think Germany, Germany right now is a very sensible country. Um, you know, at what point we should call the global leadership? Um, really, you can apply certain the political lens to a certain extent, but when it comes to human life, let's take a look at the science and the data, and uh, focus on safe life first. And between the fights and arguments and disagreements and disputes between countries. We can figure that out, out after we can collectively fight this virus first. I want to, I want to get uh, Alexander's comments to this, but before I do, um, we have a poll that I want to put up uh, to, to our uh, almost 60 people on, on the call. Um, we want to ask, can we get the poll up? We want to talk about how different countries, different powers are comparing in their way that they're adopting technology. We talked about a lot of technology, everything from uh, contact tracing apps to masks. And uh, what we want to ask, it says which of the following countries, of course it means which of the following powers, because the EU isn't a country, but which of the following do you believe has proven the most tech resilient uh, in this crisis? Uh, and the uh, panelists and hosts, we can't vote, but we can definitely see and comment on the results. So take a moment to, to vote. Um, we have, uh, I think, seven or eight options here. It's which of the following countries do you believe has proven the most tech resilient in the crisis. Uh, Brazil, China, the European Union, France, Germany, India, South Korea. Uh, and then if you scroll down, there's also the UK and the United States. So we'll take a second to uh, get those results. And while we do, uh, Alex, maybe you can you can go ahead and comment. And Russia, excuse me. Yeah, it's, it is like the like <laughs> It is. It is. It was like Vivian kicked off like such a such an interesting uh, interesting aspect. Like with her, I, I was I was uh, I was just you know like it, it, it hit me like a lightning um, uh, during this. What I just hear like from all of you is like um, when when COVID nineteen started like to to uh, to go beyond like the idea of this is just a Chinese problem, but it's a world problem, etc. All of a sudden, like you had large corporations thinking about like, how can they react? You know, like I need to shut down operations here, here, here. And so we as Ava, we profited from that because we are managing such data so we can help. But um, with that, um, we and I had the interesting insight in how decision-making also on political level is seems to be completely unrelated to the data at hand. So if you look at the, the infection rates, 
if you look at the, 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 you know, like how many people have recovered, how many have died, and you know, like all of these kind of things, acceleration rates and the data, and um, you still have, you know, like one country, I don't know, India was 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 beating up like their citizens with wooden sticks if they were, you know, like walking outside, and 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 the Swedish they said like, hey, you know, like we just go for it, like from 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 herd immunity, and you had like so many different countries making so different decisions. Um, based on the same evidence, based on the existing data. And um, somehow it seems to replicate the individual situation, you know, like where, where, where even though data is there and it's clear, you know, like you have the source, you can look at it, still people look at the information from their perspective and, and take, so to say, like the parts of the data and, 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 this, and the, and the, and, and, and the, and the information, like the basic information to justify and amplify the existing thoughts, beliefs, um, concepts, etc. A little bit like Vivian explained, like with individuals, but actually on state level. I was kind of surprised, like when, uh, when, when, when you discussed like this topic, like, wait a minute, it's the same thing on this level as well. You know, like the, the, the response to COVID was so different and which made it so complicated also like for multinational organizations to you know like we we, we need to it, we need to create like an intelligence team to understand like how every single country is reacting so that we can actually continue to run our business and um that's kind of crazy if you think about it right like let me let me take that and kick it back to Vivian before we get to the results. I mean, what he's saying is, you know, we have different uh, independent validators and we're choosing our different independent validators. Are we seeing, and I think we've seen this a little bit in the crisis, that even for those propagating disinformation or misinformation, they're credentialed people saying these things. Uh, how do we check people who have a, a medical, their medical degree, a medical doctor, but they're pushing something that, that seems to be false? But, well, therein lies the challenge. First of all, I think Alexander's point is fascinating. The idea that what we're seeing play out on the individual level is playing out at the state level as well. Um, you know, I will, uh, you know, there's, a, there's an expression uh, in English, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I am a journalist. Yeah. So everything to me looks, to me, the answer in everything is independent journalism. And, um, you know, not to, not to shift gears here, but, uh, you know, the, the, the independent media who can actually do the reporting and um, vet the data and talk to numerous credentialed individuals and get information, independent information out to the public, to me is such a critical uh, element uh, in every country of the world. Um, and, you know, which is why a, a topic for another webinar to be sure, why it's so disturbing to see attacks on a free press because again um when i was talking before about you know the degradation of evidence-based information you know favors leaders who say don't believe anybody else but me you know the the the, the solution to that is independent journalism that can um you know speak to people on the record off the record analyze the data um it is really the 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 to me, the best hope in countries all over the world. So, you know, that, that's what I, that's what I, that's what I cling to. <laughs> and have we seen a trend in that direction in this crisis? What's the state of independent journalism? Has it, is it going up? Is there awareness? Uh, what, what's oh, it looking like? Uh, well, around the world, um, the, uh, their uh, freedom of the press is degrading. That is um, according to Reporters Without Borders, Freedom House, um, you know, it's demonstrated every day by uh, Committee to Protect Journalists. The, the evidence is there. Um, it is happening all. It is happening all all over the world. Um, you know, in the United States, we certainly you know don't have much to complain about in the United States compared to what's happening, say, in the Philippines or elsewhere. But um, the sustained attacks um, on a on a free press, again, coming from the highest office of the land is uh, uh, even in a, in a country that's protected by a, a, the First Amendment, the impact that it's having is um, not so much the press doesn't keep reporting. I think we're seeing some of the finest journalism um, that I can you know, remember in my, in my, in my lifetime, um, but it is, uh, it is degrading trust in independent media. And honestly, if you can degrade trust in independent media enough, you don't need to, you don't need to attack uh, 
the First Amendment. All you need to do is get people to not believe what they read, and it has the same effect. Mm. And, and of course, advertising has, has collapsed. I don't know if it started to come back, but in the United States, I know that that was, no. was one of the issues. Um, we ha let's get the poll results. The results are ready. Uh, and then we'll turn to the audience. We've got about 20 minutes for, for Q&A. So if you have a question, raise your digital hand or, or type it in. Uh, we definitely prefer to hear your voice. So if you can, uh, we prefer the audio option. But let's see what the results of the, the first survey question were. Okay, so the question again was, which of the following countries do you believe has proven the most tech resilient in the crisis? Uh, and the results are overwhelmingly in favor of South Korea with 69%. So South Korea is definitely has an, a vast majority. Um, very interesting uh, result. Uh, maybe I can admit, I think number two is Germany uh, with 27% uh, because people could vote more than once. Uh, and then number three is China with uh, 23%. Uh, so Jennifer, uh, I'm going to kick it to you because you're closest to South Korea. Uh, what do you think, what do you, what do you take, make of these results? Um, I think South Korea, no doubt, has done a tremendous job, right? And um, South Korea government is a very good example that um, they really have this data-driven um, uh, decision-making process. To Al uh, Alistair's uh, point, that South Korea and the United States discovered the very first patient on the same day. And uh, look at the trajectory, how just extremely different these two countries are, right? But also I would say that uh, South Korea has done a great job in terms of, um, you know, uh, I think th this will go back slightly, you know, off the topic, but this go back 15 years ago, uh, I was cover covering South Korea as one part of our market. And uh, a fund manager told me um, they started to invest in um, pop culture, movies, and um, music, etc., because they think that's the way to promote the country's soft power. And back then, you know, South Korea was not a very cool country. And I thought, oh my God, this didn't make any sense. But look at where South Korea is today. And um, I think, you know, what we're seeing here in terms of um, track tracing. Um, you know, I will argue that in terms of how, you know, techno integrated technology and big data, you know, facial recognition, et cetera, the depth of usage is actually deeper in China, but China does not have the soft power um, South Korea has. So I think the perception is very important as well, right? But without shadow of doubt, South Korea has done a tremendous job. And um, another benefit is similar to Hong Kong, um, is also having experienced the SARS in Hong Kong, having experienced MERS in South Korea, um, and also S South Korea being facing, you know, North Korea threat from North Korea all the time. The country just constantly, you know, ready and standby to manage, you know, sudden crisis, right? And I think all these factors playing, it's not one single factor. Um, Ambassador Token, I have to turn to you before we get to our question. Sure. Number two in the result was, was Germany. Uh, as technologically resilient in the crisis. Did that surprise you? What do you think uh, that's about? And maybe even pull on um, uh, Jennifer's point on, on soft power. Germany actually has a lot of soft power. Uh, do you see that emanating? How, how, does it, how do you interpret this results for Germany? I interpret this result as, as, as if the question was asked, which country do you think did manage the crisis best? And I think that the word tech resilient is a bit difficult. Um, if you look at technological solutions, we have our Corona app since 36 hours or so. Yep. It has been downloaded a lot of times, but uh, so we didn't have the tech solution in place beforehand, but we had a fairly well-established health system. We did checking early on and all that stuff. Um, soft power, yes, we, I think we wield some soft power. Generally, uh, Germany enjoys a fairly good image globally in many countries and and I think the Corona crisis has undermined the, the positive reputation that Germany is able to handle such crises and be able, is, is able to, to manage its public system well. Um, about the tech part, I would, I would want to ask two or three more questions to really find out about how technological savvy do you think Germany is in, in its response to the Corona crisis? And we could get some interesting details if you dig a bit deeper. But um, I would also get, again underline that the corona crisis certainly has accelerated 
anything that's that's digital in Germany. And, and especially if I look around here in the front office where I sit right now, we have, let's say, um, gone light years ahead now with the COVID-19 crisis in terms of agility, mobility and digital working, something that has never been conceivable before. So yes, we are able to react, we are able to, 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 to manage things, but we have to keep up the momentum. That's the critical stuff. Yeah, I think the Corona has, if anything, it's been an action forcing event when it comes to tech adoption and big institutions that were very reticent about doing things like video conferencing are now doing them every day for hours. Uh, we have a yes. lot of questions now. We've got a good uh, group of questions rolling in. So let's start with Ambassador Schmidt and then Sebastian Hufnagel, and then I will go to some uh, written questions as well. So Ambassador Schmidt, you're up. Can somebody unmute him? Does it work? Yes. Yeah. You hear me? Yeah. I have a question. Uh, we were talking about uh, very often the vaccines and the medication against. Uh, how do you consider what is it the interest of certain states in investing? For example, in Germany, there's at the moment a debate. Is it correct that Germany, for example, invests in certain companies developing a vaccine in order to avoid dependence on others, in order to make sure that everybody more or less should have access to it? That's, I oversimplify it now because I don't want to refer to the other <coughs> momentum Germany invested as well in funds that say be, to make sure that not only somebody alone gets access to but a lot of other countries as well. But how do you consider that role of a state to invest particularly in one company? This, uh, I think that's for Ambassador Tolkien first, and then maybe Jen and Alexander, if you have something to add to that, that'd be great. But this, this idea of the geopolitics of vaccination. Yeah, but I think we, we don't have a debate right now whether it's okay or not to take a share in, in CureVac, the company that, that, that's discussed right now. But there was a debate uh, two months ago when the rumor came up that some parts, some players in the US would like to take over CureVac, the German company, to make sure that the vaccine is available for the US market. That created a strong debate. But now the, the taking an equity in CureVac has passed, and I've seen it mentioned in the media, but there has not been a fierce debate, is it right or is it wrong? I think people would, in general, say, we think it's okay, we want this, this company to be able to, to do its work in Germany or wherever it's active, and we want this vaccine to be available to everybody. And this is what we always say. Jen, so, do you wanna? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll add a couple of things. I think in the time of crisis, uh, human nature, both good and bad are amplified, right? And this human nature um, probably were expanding to, you know, the, the nature of uh, various leaders in different country as well. In terms of vaccine, I think, um, as a Chinese, I would love, you know, if that, you know, very unfortunately, this virus has started in China, but um, right now it's already started. And the most important thing is how we can end it, right? And I think, you know, for, uh, and I, I believe, you know, there are a lot of Chinese people really hope that, um, you know, vaccine could be developed in China and then shared uh, for the world. And, you um, uh, you know, individual companies is quite interesting, you know, uh, quite unusually uh, local government and in individual companies uh, kind of uh, stepped, you know, uh, beside the central government actually started to do international aids, which never happened before as well during this crisis. Um, I would say also, this is a great opportunity that for global leaders and, you know, from business and government policy technology to come together. Um, I'm a trustee of a project called the Commons Project, and it's supported by uh, Rockefeller Foundation, Gates Foundation, etc. And uh, basically, a group of us, you know, we started last year, wanted to build digital, uh, uh, you know, digital in infrastructure for greater good with uh, data in in integrity and privacy, respect privacy, etc. And then COVID happened, so now we are focused on you know, building a common past that, you know, bring countries in Africa, China, Asia, um, and hopefully Europe as well to uh, enable individuals to start international travel safely as well. And um, we're getting a lot of support from, you know, company including Google, uh, Microsoft, Samsung, Alibaba, etc. And I think, you know, this is a 
very unfortunate episode, um, you know, for our collective humanity in the world. But it, it is also a great opportunity for all of us to step up together and, you know, put politics and differences aside and do something, you know, for, for mankind, for, you know, people's survival. Well, let me, let me pull that, that thread and ask a question of Ambassador Tolkien and Alexander. Uh, you mentioned, you know, working to make sure that there's interoperability in the systems, the tech systems that we're creating to underlie bringing the global economy back online. How has the work been across borders? Uh, I know that at least looking at the contact tra tracing app debate in Germany, it's been extremely national and there's been a big divergence in debates in Europe. Is there any effort right now to make sure that these systems are interoperable? That way we're bringing the entire global economy back online or are we just looking at the national level? Perhaps uh, Ambassador Token and then, and then Alex. You know, the big debate in Germany was whether we should have a decentralized or a centralized solution to the app. And we decided for the, de for the decentralized solution for data security purposes. France has gone a different, uh, has, has taken a different direction. And now it's, of course, very difficult to reconcile these two approaches. Um, I agree it would be um, wonderful to have at least a European-wide app. Uh, if international travel picks up again, it would be wonderful to have an international system in place. Um, but I do not see the discussion taking place anywhere now. But I'm not, not in the midst of corona crisis management here. There might be something happening in some forum that I do not see. But um, we should work in this direction, certainly. Uh, Alex, and then I'm going to ask uh, Sebastian's question. In, in, in in general, it's it's there, there is there is definitely in, in 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 the if you look at it from a from a from a from a standpoint of how is interoperability and, and and over the uh, are, are there any attempts like to work together or uh, across borders as well? And um, to me, it seems more like for us looking at the world like with, with with what we do. But we but but if you but if you go into single and in separate countries, um, it really depends uh, on the. We yeah, would see like on, on, on the current uh, political power, also international power, whether countries um, rather opt for um, for taking their own perspective and looking at them first, so to say, and also using technology and using uh, these these opportunities to actually influence uh, globally. Um, and then on the other side, you have you have uh, you have. Um, you have like countries that simply can cannot create like their own answer, uh, like technological or any other type of answers like to this. And it seems to me as if COVID nineteen in that regard was definitely also a trigger, like for the dices to be um, put in the air again, right? Like they have not really have they they really have not fallen so far in terms of uh, who comes out more stronger out of this crisis and who not technology will definitely play a play a role in that but there are many many countries outside of this debate because they have simply no you know like no infrastructure no existing capabilities to build something themselves whether that is in the medical field or that is like in the in the, in the digital technology field and um and uh, with the others like us europe and the particular european countries like china uh, and south korea it is it is it seems that as if as if as if uh as if most of these conversations, if you look at them more closely, are not really uh, health and, and society related in, in the sense of health and public health, but to some extent they stay, they move over like into a into power struggle um, to some extent, right? And um, this is this is interesting to see. I, I, I personally I don't have a I don't have a, have a brilliant answer to share. I was listening as, as you and most of the others like to what has been said in this field. To me, it's a lot of chaos still. Uh, a lot mm. of a lot of things are. In, in the making new collaborations, new partnerships, uh, uh, and and everybody's like trying to to move his way forward. Maybe one note in terms of like how um, how Germany um, has been has been managing this. I mean, like the, the the idea of creating like a national technology like to track this is complicated enough in Germany because you have the federal uh, system and you know like everybody does like its own thing so we can be really really happy that we emerged like to something that we have and all of the criticism aside I think it was really really good um, really really good activity um, but there are also other uh, discussions like the CureVac discussion you know investment of, of, of the 
of, of a country like into technology in some way and this um this was something that 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 i that i was even afraid of before uh covid 19 uh started um the complete conversation around geopolitics of technology investment and and ownership you know like in germany and all over europe you have the discussion of you know like um uh, is it allowed for for for, for chinese uh, investor or maybe us american investor to invest like in european or german technology under which circumstances you know like who can prevent that and who not and this is like really a major shift like in the perspective of ownership and property um which i'm uh, to some extent really concerned of of course as an entrepreneur right. it's a great point um we have a question from sebastian hufnagel uh he you're up you've got your digital hand raised we'll, we'll unmic you thank you tyson and thanks to the panel for the interesting discussion um my name is sebastian hufnagel i work for dell technologies and um my question is about decoupling uh, of technology supply chains uh, between Europe, the US and China, a trend that we've been observing already before COVID uh, with the trade tensions between China and the US notably, but also with the discussions around 5G security and tech sovereignty in that context. So to what extent do you believe that uh, the COVID-19 crisis has accelerated this existing trend of relocalizing um, supply chains for information technology? Thank you. Perhaps Jennifer and then uh, Alex. Sure. Thank you for your question, Sebastian. Um, as you have uh, rightly pointed out, this uh, decoupling uh, demand has started before COVID. But what COVID really accelerated is this, um, um, you know, physically supply chain just really stopped for a good while earlier this year. And uh, and also as uh, Ambassador Token also mentioned that. If you if you ask any of us, you know, uh, and, and on top of January this year, nobody would expect it that you know mask and uh, you know ventilator could become national security issue, right? And so, what COVID nineteen really make every country realize is that um, you know how fragile this globalized supply chain is, and um, um, now compounded with the geopolitical tension between U.S. and China. Uh, for any company that has um, been relying on global supply chain has to think twice. So um, I, I deal with a lot of uh, smart, uh, smart car uh, vehicle um, manufacturing in China. And um, in 80s and 90s, especially, you know, Germany and Japan, Germany and Japan really led this very, you know, uh, just in time uh, supply chain efficiency um, that has basically in the past 18 months gone away. It's not about efficiency anymore. It's about supply chain security. Everybody have to, every manufacturer have to over, you know, stock with their inventory. You have to make sure you have enough supply. So efficiency is uh, becoming secondary, uh, which from environmental point of view, it's actually quite disastrous. However, I think, you know, uh, it's inevitable this decoupling is already happening. Um, people compare this as the new Cold War, but I think it's completely different from Cold War because uh, Soviet Union never had, you know, the largest market in the world. And um, uh, America also didn't have a lot of companies, you know, have large market share in, in China. Um, and um, in Soviet Union, so so I I imagine you know after COVID the world will become a two track system. One track is a very U.S. centric, and another track is very China centric. And unfortunately, a lot of global companies, and we're seeing some of the you know when it comes to five G, etc. Countries like Germany already have to make a you know uh, take a side. Um, which is very unfortunate, but there's now the you know secret talk happening right now as we speak um, in Hawaii. So let's see how it goes. And I think end of the day, every country will require a very thorough economic recovery um, to exclude um, you know U.S. market or exclude China market uh, will mean. Uh, great compromise in terms of economic recovery. So. Um, I'm probably foolishly optimistic that, you know, at least from business point of view, um, companies will come on consensus that, you know, we still need to have a global supply chain, a global market. Alexander, and then uh, Ambassador Token, and uh, keep it brief, and we'll get to one very, very short final question. 
uh, to keep it brief, I would only have to say I couldn't agree more with what Jen <laughs> just said. Um, you know, I, I don't believe there is there is such thing as a national economy these days. First of all, you know, it's, it's imagine like all of the great things that 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 we as humans can can um, can can profit from, like with this with with how the world economically and globally has evolved. And hey, I, I don't want to say like there are tons of and hundreds and thousands of problems that still have to be solved. But um, if it weren't for the globalized connectedness of our world, both on information as well as on supply and travel and all of that, um, we, yeah, we would not probably have like such a fast uh, distribution of mis and disinformation of, uh, of information around like the virus on, on the virus itself and on the problems that come like with the with these global uh, supply chain networks but then on the other side look around us you know like we're trying to protect the world that actually evolved from globalization in the way that we're living in right now so i think it's good to protect it and i'm also very optimistic and hopeful that that um that after this kind of rebound we will get potentially back to a better uh way of collaborating a little bit more resilient maybe but generally yeah global please Ambassador Token, and maybe Vivian can jump in on this too. I saw her react to the, the talk about uh, globalization disinformation. I'd like to register a, a dissenting vote here. I think <laughs> that COVID-19 has not accelerated the politically uh, induced decoupling between China and the US. I see a lot of, let's say, questioning of supply chains and so on, but there passes hardly any day here when we in the foreign office do not talk about decoupling. And everything that I've seen in the, in the last 12, 18 months has been politically motivated and has been pushed by new listings, new policy decisions, new tweets, you name it. But not by COVID-19. I think there's a lot, lot of effects that we still we need to understand and to analyze. But for the technological decoupling, I, I disagree here. Okay. Uh, well, then I have a final question for all of you guys. Very brief. Um, it's the day after COVID, post-COVID. We've we've somehow we've solved the 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 crisis, either through a vaccine or or somehow. Um, what do you hope technologically stays with us, and what do you fear technologically stays with us? And you can pick either either path. You pick either the hope path or the fear path. And perhaps we can start with uh, Alex, then Jen, then Ambassador Token, then, then Vivian. It was a German politician. Maybe he, he, he quoted someone who said, like, uh, COVID-19 is also not just a test of our healthcare system, but also of our character. Um, the, the, whenever, whenever we collaborate, whenever we work together on a global, national uh, a regional level, uh, things evolve to something better. There are problems, I agree, um, but uh, the parts where politicians, business people, societies have collaborated um, has always like also in this, in this uh, COVID crisis led to something positive and I hope that uh, this will remain as a, as, a, um, as, a, as a philosophy which then drives technology to be more collaborative and more, more inclusive and global, yeah. Thank you, Jin. Um, during COVID, you know, in China, the, uh, out of necessity, a lot of middlemen from uh, drug device ser medical service distribution has been taken away and that improved the speed and also uh, significantly reduced the cost for uh, individuals. I hope that part will stay and I hope a lot of developing countries will be able to, you know, benefit this model as well. And, um, uh, what I concern to, you know, most fear probably, of course, is privacy. I think, you know, uh, in a moment like this, all of us just give away our data without even asking a question. And uh, how do we retract going back to, you know, where can we can still protect our privacy? It's something uh, everybody has to ask that question. Ambassador. Yes, I've, I've worked for a couple of years now in the Foreign Office and for, for most of my time here, there was a, a strong notion only those who are present in the office, who have the lights still uh, up and running at 10 o'clock in the evening, it's only those who actually work and, and, and take the job seriously. This notion of being present is completely gone, it's exploded, it's evaporated, it's pulverized, it's no longer there and I hope this will stay. It doesn't matter anymore where you do your job. Very good. I'm sorry, I'm sitting in my office right now. <laughs> <laughs>
Vivian. Yeah, I'll I'll do a quick negative, but then I'm I'm gonna and then end on the on the on the um, hopeful note. So um, the negative is um, it our reliance on technology and particularly on connectivity and devices has been revealed in this crisis in the United States. And unfortunately, there's still a great division between the haves and haves nots. There's not enough connectivity to um, people that need it in terms of um, children learning from home and um, access to the kind of technology for, for people who are under underprivileged. Um, so that's something that we need, that this is revealed we need to solve for from a technology point of view. But the hopeful note is I've been really astounded by um, the resilience that people have shown across the board to adapt um, and, and using technology to solve problems, both to solve, um, both to connect in ways that we're all embracing these kind of virtual, uh, these, these virtual platforms, and also an inc incredible uh, explosions of, uh, of creativity, just the, the kind of um, uh, creativity that has been exhibited um, on every technology platform using technology devices. Um, has really been that that creativity and resilience and adaptability has I've, I've been found to be really inspiring. That is, it's a great note to end on. Um, <laughs> just to quote Alexander, he said that there is a lot of state-driven, state-based chaos right now. I don't know if we brought any order to that chaos, but we <laughs> definitely tried to make a little bit of sense of it. Um, I want to thank Alexander, uh, Jennifer, uh, Henrik, and Vivian for, for being with us today. It was great to have three continents, four excellent speakers here with us. Um, and this is actually the last uh, in this series on COVID in tech. At Aspen Germany, we're going to be starting a series on the great decoupling, but not the great decoupling you're thinking of, rather the relationship between technology, productivity, and labor, and how uh, technology is supplanting, subsuming labor in an automated world and what that means for the social contract. So I hope that you guys can all join us for those conversations. But until then, stay cool and stay healthy. Bye guys. Thank you so Thank you much. All. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks.